Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Pastor Julia Crone, one of the associate pastors here, and it's my joy to welcome you to worship at The Vine, an online campus of Wrightsville United Methodist Church. We are so glad that you are taking the time to join us in worship today. We'd love to have a chance to connect with you and to know that you are here. And so if you would, please take a moment and fill out our little questionnaire uh, that helps us connect with you. You can do that either by um, clicking the link that's in this video description or by following the QR code that will appear on the screen in just a few moments. I now invite you to take a deep breath, quiet your heart, and let's prepare for worship. Will you join me in prayer? Holy and loving God, we thank you for this time you've given us, this time that is set apart to worship you. We thank you for your presence that is gathering us together, even though we are far apart. We thank you for the blessing of your presence and the blessing of the communion of saints that you are joining us into. God, I ask that in this time, we would be transformed by an encounter with you. Open up our hearts to receive your love. Unstop our ears so that we could truly hear a convicting word from you. Lord, we want to be your disciples, and we welcome you into this space and into this time. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hello, I'll be reading Psalm 8 today, Divine Majesty and Human Dignity. Please hear God's word for us. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you've established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? Yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I want Jesus to walk with me. I want Jesus to walk with me all along my pilgrim journey. Lord, I want Jesus to walk with me. 
in my trials Lord walk with me in my trials Lord walk with me when my heart is almost breaking Lord I want Jesus to walk with me when I'm troubled, Lord, walk with me. When I'm troubled, Lord, walk with me. When my head is bowed in sorrow, Lord, I want Jesus to walk. I'm Pastor David Haley, one of the associate pastors here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church, and it's my privilege now to lead us in prayer. I invite you to join with me as we go before God in prayer. During the prayer, I'm going to pause to give you the opportunity to speak the names of people that you would like to lift up in prayer today. So let us pray together. Heavenly Father, you inhabit eternity. The heavens declare your glory, and the earth announces your beauty. Your presence fills the universe, and yet in Christ you come to us with compassion and mercy. Help us to find light in our darkness, joy in our sorrow, healing in our sickness, and help us to find your great grace that covers a multitude of sins. We know of people who feel their souls cast down for want of peace in their hearts and minds. Speak your gracious word of comfort and grant them peace. We especially pray today for those whom we now name with our voices or in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Thank you, Lord, for your promise to never forsake us or leave us. Help us to live lives through which you bless others. Through Jesus Christ we pray. And as Jesus taught his disciples to pray, so now we also pray as God's confident children as we say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I guess you saw the news this past week. Uh, this past Wednesday, it seems that uh, Punxsutawney Phil, the groundhog, saw his shadow and is predicting six more weeks of winter. And it was confirmed by Sir Walter Wally, the counterpart groundhog in Raleigh. However, you may be interested to know that it was not unanimous as Staten Island Chuck, among other groundhogs, did not see his shadow and predicted an early spring. It's kind of like trying to get folks in church to agree on giving. Uh, some people don't ever want giving to be mentioned in church. Others think it should be taught. And still others feel like it should be constantly mentioned and preached about. Well, here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church, we do believe that giving is important as an act of worship, giving back to God out of gratitude for what God has given us. 
Your offerings to God help support ministries through our church, like Sunday school classes for all ages, meeting every Sunday morning. Sunday school classes give us the opportunity to study the Bible together with others who are at a similar stage in life. So we have classes for adults, for youth, and for children. You can worship God by giving offerings at a live worship service or by mailing checks to P.O. Box 748, Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina, or through our church website or through our cell phone app. Let us pray. Eternal God, we worship you with our giving because we know that our lives rightfully belong to you. Help us, through Jesus, to make our own offering complete by living in obedience to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. No looking back, no looking back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. No turning back, no turning back. No turning back, no turning back. No Pastor David, one of the associate pastors at Riceville United Methodist Church, and I am here today to do the children's sermon. So if you have children nearby who are not already watching this video, or you, now's a great time to call them over because I've got something really special to share. Now, as you can see, I'm not in the church today. I'm actually uh, in the control room on the USS aircraft carrier Yorktown. And you can see behind me part of the flight deck and some uh, airplanes that are on exhibit there. Now, this aircraft carrier was in several wars. And the way an aircraft carrier works is that it launches the planes out in the middle of the ocean in enemy territory so they can go and carry out their mission. And then they return back to the aircraft carrier for refueling and, and everything that uh, needs to get them ready for the next mission. Now, you know what? The church is like an aircraft carrier because the church sends us forth, it launches us forth after our Sunday service, sends us out into the world to carry out our mission to make disciples of Jesus Christ, to share the gospel, to minister, to help people in need. And then we come back to church in order to refuel and recharge and get ready for our next mission. So uh, I'm having a great time on this very, very cold day on the USS Yorktown. Uh, if you have a chance, you need to come to Charleston, South Carolina and visit this show. Let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you for our church that launches us forth to carry out the mission you've given us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. It's great to worship with you today on the Vine. My name's Doug Lane, senior pastor here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church. 
and I'm honored and privileged to uh, be able to bring today's uh, scripture reading and to be able to proclaim uh, the sermon today. So let's check it out. We're in um, Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, um, one of the Old Testament prophets, in chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Isaiah says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him, each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Almighty and everlasting God, Lord, we thank you for the words of the prophets, how you spoke to them and how you speak through them to us. Lord, speak to us anew this day. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, sometimes we forget that by the wondrous grace of God, people really can be changed in a miraculous way. Our lesson for the day tells about a man named Isaiah who experienced God's grace in just this way. But I'm also going to share some stories today that I find very similar to Isaiah's, even if these other people uh, had very different stations in life. But I want to begin with our hero, the prophet Isaiah. Let's look at it again. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, writes Isaiah. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Woe to me, Isaiah cried, I am ruined. For I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among the people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. And then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he'd taken with tongs from the altar, and with it he touched my mouth, and he said, See, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for me? And I said, Here am I, send me. What a marvelous piece of scripture. I think it's worth reading two times. But I want to keep this part in mind. The words, woe to me, for I am a man of unclean lips. As we turn over to the New Testament, to a very similar episode in the life of Simon Peter, I'm now describing a story from Luke chapter 5. Early in his ministry, Jesus was preaching on the shore of Lake Gennesaret. The crowd was pressing in on him, and he noticed two empty boats that were standing at the water's edge while the fishermen cleaned their nets. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, the boat's owner, to push out a little into the water so that he could sit in the boat and speak to the crowds. When he finished speaking, he turned to Simon and said, put out in the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon was weary, and he answered, Master, we've worked hard all night, and we had not caught a thing. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. And this time the nets were so full of fish they began to tear In fact, it was not long until both boats were so full of fish that they were about to sink. Then the scriptures tell us that when Simon realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Again, beautiful, memorable story. Now you've got two verses I want you to remember. The first, woe to me, for I'm a man of unclean lips. And now St. Peter's words, go away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. But wait, there's more. St. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15 
It's the story of how the resurrected Christ appeared to the disciples, first to Peter, later to the rest of the twelve, then to 500 more followers, most of whom were still alive when Paul wrote. And finally, Paul writes, Last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. Listen as Paul continues, For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. So here's the third verse for you to remember. For I am the least of the apostles because I persecuted the church of God. You see the similarities in these three stories? The progression of the faith experience of these three important biblical figures is almost identical. First, they're made aware of their sinfulness and their inadequacy. Second, they experience God's grace. And finally, they are called to a great ministry. Let's consider for just a minute how these three stages of development came about so that we too might become great disciples of Christ through our own faith development. Note, first of all, how each was made aware of their sinfulness and their dependence upon God. Consider Isaiah's experience. He writes, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. What a majestic vision of God that Isaiah is privileged to behold. But also notice Isaiah's response to beholding God's majesty. Woe to me. For I am a man of unclean lips. Now Isaiah had fancied himself to be a good man, a righteous man. But suddenly, in the presence of God, he saw himself as he really was. He saw that much of his righteousness was merely a sham. It was a show, something to parade before the world, but too superficial to build a satisfying life on. Simon Peter probably thought he had it made too. After all, he owned his own fishing boat. He's a successful small businessman. He had his work, his family, his health. You could imagine him on the Galilean version of Wicked Tuna. What more could anyone ask? Peter didn't know the answer to that until that fateful day when he crossed paths with Jesus of Nazareth. He allowed Jesus, whom he was just getting to know, to use his boat as a floating platform from which to teach. When he'd finished his teaching, Jesus turned to Simon Peter and told him to turn his boat into deep water and let down his nets for a catch. As he noted, Simon was tired. He answered, Master, come on. We've worked hard all night. We haven't caught a thing. But because you say so, I'll let down the nets. This time, the nets are so full of fish that they begin to tear. In fact, it's not long until both boats are so full that they're about to sink. Simon is astounded, as are the other fishermen who are with him, and suddenly they realize that Jesus is somebody special. What is Peter's response? almost exactly as Isaiah's. He cried out, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. He realized he did not deserve to catch this great, this great amount of fish. He realized how empty and meaningless his life really was. He was made aware of his sinfulness and his need for God. Now let's consider St. Paul. St. Paul, like Simon, He's called by a different name before he meets the resurrected Christ on the road to Damascus. He was Saul, the dreaded persecutor of the church. But he had a blinding experience of Christ on the Damascus road, and a radical change took place in his life. Suddenly he's aware of just how misguided, just how cruel, just how vindictive his previous life had been. It's hard to believe that Paul, the persecutor of the church, could become Paul the author of 1 Corinthians 13, the greatest living document on love ever written. Only Christ can make a change in the heart like that. So how did Paul describe his experience? He said, I am the least of the apostles. and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, for I persecuted the church of God. Friends, this is stage one of the development of a faith that will actually change the world is to behold the awesomeness of God as revealed in Jesus Christ and then be made aware of our own need for God. If we're going to become what God means for us to become, we're going to have to see ourselves as God sees us. That's the first step for growth. The first reason many people do not give their lives unconditionally to God 
is that they never come to the realization of their need for God. And so they live these bland, mediocre, indifferent, common lives. I don't care if you're rich or poor or where you're from. It's just the feeling that people end up having because they never have experienced that need for God's amazing grace. They never experience it. But that's step one in developing a vital faith. It's the realization of our need for God. Step two is that blessed experience of grace. When Isaiah cried out, Woe to me, I am ruined, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, the seraphim touched Isaiah's lip with that coal and said, Lo, this hath touched your lips. Your guilt's taken away. Your sin is taken away. When Peter acknowledged his guilt and fell on his knees before Jesus, immediately Christ told him, don't be afraid. And St. Paul wrote, for I'm the least of the apostles, don't even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church, and then adds, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. Each of these three men was made painfully aware of their sinfulness in the face of the holiness of God. But they were also made wonderfully aware of God's grace. They knew their sins were forgiven and they were restored as children of God. Lately, my wife and I have been watching the TV show 1883. It's a prequel of sorts to the very popular show Yellowstone. 1883 tells the story of a family in a wagon train headed out west on the Oregon Trail with families hoping to find a better life. It stars Tim McGraw and his real-life wife, Faith Hill. Now, most of you know Tim McGraw as a country singer. Seeing Tim in the show made me go back and listen to all these old songs that uh, he sang 20, 25 years ago. But I also got interested in his personal story. Now, if you don't know his backstory, it's pretty interesting. Tim McGraw was born out of wedlock when a minor league baseball player met a teenage waitress living in the same apartment complex. His dad would go on to be be a very successful major league player, but it wasn't until Tim was 18 years old that his dad acknowledged that he was actually his child. And in the meantime, his mother went on to marry an abusive alcoholic. Tim did well in school and he excelled in sports despite his dysfunctional family life, but as he got older, he became addicted to drugs and alcohol. Of course, Tim went on to find success as a country singer and married another famous singer in Faith Hill. But he came to realize that he could lose it all if he kept up his hard partying lifestyle. Reflecting back on those days, he said, I knew I had instability and dysfunction in me from the way I grew up. And one day, Faith gave him an ultimatum. Partying or having a family? Pick one, buddy. And Tim knew he had to change, and he credits God's grace for helping him to do it. In an interview in Esquire magazine back in August, he said, sometimes God just walks through the room and you happen to be standing there. He already had success. But until God came to him through faith, he was headed toward a life of loneliness and pain. Our own lives may never grab the spotlights, but if we are to have faith that transcends the ordinary, sometime in our life, we must also come to realize our absolute dependence upon God, and we must experience His power to make us into a new creation. Such a realization will deliver us from living lukewarm lives, half committed, and only partially satisfied. Seeing ourselves as we really are, experiencing God's grace to make a new start in life, these are only the first two steps, but there's a third. That's the call to a purposeful life. The Lord asks, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And Isaiah cries out, here am I, send me. And Jesus says to the frightened Simon Peter, I will make you a fisher of men. And immediately he follows after the master. And St. Paul acknowledges that he had persecuted the Christians, that he was the least of the apostles, but he adds that by God's grace he worked harder than any of them. That's what happens when we have an encounter with the living God. And it's the most important encounter we'll ever have, giving our lives completely to Christ. It's said that hymn writer Charles Wesley wrote his first hymn just three days after his conversion to Christ. That hymn was, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. It's the 
very first hymn in our hymnal. That was how exuberant he felt after he encountered God. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. As the years pass, Charles Wesley is said to have written 6,500 more hymns. It's ironic. Wesley asked for a thousand tongues to sing, and through the singing of his hymns, throughout the Christian world, God gave him millions of tongues to sing. And we've been singing God's praises for now more than 200 years since Wesley first wrote that hymn. But allow me to give you one last example. There once was a 15-year-old boy. He had everything. Great parents, lived in a nice house, lots of friends. He was smart. He was popular. He was on the high school baseball team. He was the lead in the school play. He went to church because that's what his family did, but he never stopped to think much about his role in the church, his personal relationship with Christ, his spiritual gifts, his sins, his blessings, the plight of others. After taking on a leadership role in worship on Youth Sunday, an old man that he'd never met before and would never see again told him, you are going to make a great pastor one day. The boy was taken back. What a weird thing for someone to say. He never even considered being a pastor before. Pastors had to be wise and holy. He was just a teenage boy. He's pretty self-centered. He thought, I can't do that. I'm just a regular guy. I don't have what it takes to be a pastor. But maybe he could grow up to be someone different than he was at 15. So he talked to a Sunday school teacher about it. And he said to him that he thought he might become a pastor when he got older. And his Sunday school teacher said, yeah, I remember going through that phase when I was your age too. Knowing that everything was a phase that you would eventually outgrow when you're 15, the boy decided that maybe he shouldn't take this thought too seriously. So eight years passed by, and the boy grows up into a young man. He was a student in law school, but decided to spend a summer working with children at a Methodist summer camp. One day, he was out paddling a canoe with a young boy who'd never been in a boat before. Surrounded by the beauty of God's creation, the boy turned to the now 23-year-old who'd once been told he'd make a great pastor, and he said to him out of the blue, tell me about God. And the young man did. And the two talked in the canoe about God's love, and God's power, and God's wisdom. And the 23-year-old remembered that old man who told him years earlier that one day he'd make a great pastor. And so he decided he'd quit law school, and more importantly, he decided he'd try to quit being so self-centered and instead tell people about a more purposeful life in Christ. This Thursday, that young man will turn 51. He still enjoys talking about God, and he still needs to work on being a little less self-centered. Not everyone's going to have the same kind of experience that I had or Charles Wesley or Isaiah or Peter or Paul or Tim McGraw. But each of us in our own way can have an experience of God that transforms our life into something more beautiful. First of all, we need to see ourselves as we really are, totally dependent on God. Secondly, we need to pray that God will help us in our daily lives to experience His amazing grace and power. And finally, we need a sense of direction. Lives patterned after the life of Jesus Christ. Then and only then will we become the kind of people that God has created us to become. Christians, followers, disciples. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Holy God, you are truly a loving all-knowing, and all-powerful. And Lord, we depend on you for everything. Everything that we have is yours. Lord, thank you for extending your grace to us, for loving us even when we get it wrong. Lord, help us to figure out the purpose and direction that you have for each of our lives, utilizing our gifts to build up your kingdom. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. 
Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now I invite you to confess your sins to God in silent prayer. Now hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also also with with you. you. Lift up your hearts. We We lift lift them up to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is is right right to to give give our our thanks thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy holy Lord, Lord, God of power and might, heaven and and earth are full of your your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, He took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink this, do this in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ Christ has has died, died. Christ Christ is is risen. risen. Christ Christ will will come come again. again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We invite you now to receive Holy Communion using whatever elements you have brought with you to the table. This is the body of Christ broken for you. And this is the blood of Christ shed for you. I, the Lord, have seen the sky. I have heard my people cry, all who dwell in dark and sin, my hand will save. 
I who made the stars of night, I will make their darkness bright. Who will bear my light to them? Whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord, if you lead me. I will hold your people in my heart. I, the Lord of snow and rain, I have borne my people's pain. I have wept for love of them, they turn away. I will break their hearts of stone, give them love for love alone. I will speak my word to them, whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord, is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night if you lead me I will follow I will hold your people in my heart I the Lord of wind and flame I will tend the poor and lame I will set a feast for them my hand will save Finest bread I will provide Till their hearts be satisfied I will give my life to them Whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling In the night I will go, Lord if you lead me, I will hold your people in my heart. Hey, you remember in last week's sermon when I told you that we we're going to spend the next few weeks here at church um, doing a lot of things that are going to impact the community? We're calling it Tackling Hunger. Right, And so what we're going to do starting this week, starting on Tuesday, in fact, is we're having a packing day with Nourish NC. Now, Nourish NC puts together food kits that go home with uh, children who don't have enough to eat. And so if you want to be a part of that, call the church, find out more information, or visit our church website, and that takes place this coming Tuesday. Wednesday and Thursday, we're going to be bringing food to the church, okay? And this food is going to Snipes Academy, to Walking Tall in the Feast Congregation, and to the Methodist Home for Children. So we're looking for everything from bathroom tissue to healthy snacks. These are things that, that we can give away, uh, once again, especially to children and to families, okay? So think, what, what would a kid like to eat? right? Um, and we're going to bring that to the church Wednesday and Thursday of this week. And then uh, finally, we're, we told you earlier on that um, we're going to be kicking off a series about the intersection of spirituality and mental health. And we're doing that on February the 15th. On the 15th, that's a Tuesday, I believe, um, we're going to be um, having uh, Dr. Jessica Whitney come in and talk to us about cultivating healthy habits in this new year. That's going to be at 7 o'clock here at the church, um, cultivating healthy habits. And um, we just invite you or anybody that you know that you think might um, get something out of a seminar like that. Um, I'm going to be there. I hope that you'll be there as well on Tuesday, February 15th. Well, that's all the announcements I have for today. But... I do invite you to think hard about your relationship with Jesus and remember that all of us are dependent upon God and that all of us have some way in our lives experienced God's grace and love. And let's pray.
that if we have not figured it out already, that God will give us direction and purpose so that we might help build up his kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. Go forth in peace. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. Go now in peace, go now in peace, may the love of God be with you everywhere, everywhere you may be.